Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for um, being with us here this afternoon. Uh, my name is Suzanne Dontremont, and I'm one of the cons consultants that's working with um, the Department of Health. And uh, just firstly, I wanted to just let you know that um, there is a chat box on the left and that Sarah will be monitoring um, that chat box. So if you do have a question to ask along the way, feel, please feel free to do that, um, just to type that in. And, and we'll, we'll look at the questions as they come along. Um, and we will have some time at the end as well. So um, I'm just going to ask Ty and Mara to uh, your conference room, please. Great. Thank you. Great. So. Um, this uh, session, this education session, is looking at um, healthcare providers in looking at uh, prevention of pressure injury. And um, oh, I'm not able to move up or down with my. There we go. And I uh, just wanted to tell you a little bit about this, about myself. Um, my name is Suzanne Dontremont, and um, I spent a lot of time with VON in my career. Um, I was with VON for a number of years and um, did a lot of work around wound care, wound care and uh, pressure injury prevention um, and various ulcers and looking at those kinds of things. I now work in long-term care. I work at Villa Cadien, uh, sorry, Villa St. Joseph de Luc. It's in, um, in Yarmouth and um, was brought on to work with the Department of Health. And so what you'll see in front of you is um, a presentation that we developed collaboratively with Department of Health, with um, myself at the Villa, and with Bernadette Mitchell McDonald at Northwood. And so um, I'm just going to look at a disclaimer and just to know that um, the educational material was developed as part of the quality improvement initiative that was led by the Department of Health and Wellness um, and continuing care as partners with Northwood Halifax and with Saint, uh, Villa St. Joseph de Lac as well. This document is a compilation of information to support um, the healthcare providers. So the purpose of this resource is to support con con continuity of care, to enhance knowledge and build capacity and, and address pressure injury prevention and management in long-term care facilities. The information that you'll see in front of you is not designed or intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, looking at diagnos diagnosis and treatment as well. And it should not be used as a replacement. Just so remember, you'll use this in the care that you provide to, you, to your residents. Um, Every effort has been made to ensure the accuracy of the contents and at the time that this was developed. So just keep that in mind as well. And um, there's just an acknowledgement there for the folks that contributed to this, myself and Bernadette and uh, Kathy Burrows as well. So when we look at the purpose of why we developed this document, um, about a year ago we had an opportunity to do some education in a project that we worked on with the Department of Health. And we did some education in the province of Nova Scotia um, in eight different places. And that education was around pressure injury prevention in long-term long care. And um, with that, what we noticed was that um, in a lot of instances, we had RNs, LPNs, we had some physicians, we had pharmacists, we had OT, we had PT, we had dietitians. Um, but not very often did we notice that we had CCAs that attended the, the sessions. And we, we educated over 700 people in that endeavor. And so we felt pretty strongly that we needed to do something that would be um, directed towards the CCAs, um, knowing full well that they are our eyes and our, and our hands um, in our long-term care facilities. And, and so that's why we decided to develop this, this um, this presentation to be used as an education opportunity. What you'll notice with this presentation is that it breaks all the rules of developing a PowerPoint. You'll see lots of words on the slides. And that's really because we also developed it with the intention that it be used as um, a self-study as well. So that long-term care facilities can use them, can make them available to um, all the folks that work in long-term care, actually, not just the CCAs. And it can be done as a self-study. So we also offer um, a handbook that can go with this as well. Um, and so just keep that in mind when you look. And there's lots of words on, on the slides. So when we talk about pressure injury prevention, really 
when we talk about long-term care facilities, whose role is it anyway? And when we look at whose role it is, we have a number of individuals that work in our facilities and we know that everybody plays a part and it really is about teamwork and that everybody contributes in ensuring um, that we provide the best care possible to our residents. So we look at the RNs and the LPNs and know that the CCAs and the PCWs um, work very closely together in ensuring um, that our residents get the best care. We look at our rehab assistants and what they do to ambulate our residents and to ensure that they get exercise and that um, that they're doing all the things that they need to do. We look at OT and PT and all the assessments that are done by that department in ensuring that there's proper surfaces and that the residents are doing what they need to do. We look at the dietitian, we look at kitchen to ensure that they're getting proper nutrition and looking at various things in relation to when they do develop um, pressure injuries and what we can do to best provide um, the, the, the an optimum healing environment. We look at housekeeping. We know that with housekeeping, laundry and maintenance, we know that they know lots of things about our residents and they can tell us things as well and contribute. And if they're educated along the way, um, they're key people in ensuring that our residents get the proper care. We know that the administration and that our directors of care are there and they're supporting all these endeavors and ensuring that all um, all our staff uh, get the education that they need. And then there's folks that provide the education, such as myself. I'm the clinical educator. Somebody needs to go on mute, I yeah, believe. Sorry, we have someone that uh, needs to go on mute there, please. And then we have recreation as well, and those folks um, also play a big role in ensuring that our residents get proper care and being able to um, notice things in the way that our residents are and changes within that resident and sometimes it may be red spots and that sort of thing as well. So ensuring that our team is is well educated is, is key in the care that we provide um, as a team to our residents. So this is just a quick sort of summary of kind of what we're going to cover with this this hour session, but just looking at what kinds of questions you can ask yourself um, as we move through this this presentation, but you know, who plays a role in the prevention of pressure injuries? And I guess we just answered that, but we know that it's a whole team that um, contributes to that. Um, what's the body's first defense against pressure injuries? We're gonna cover that. Why do you think the CCA's role is really important? And we'll talk about that as well. And can you explain how pressure injury develops? Um, keep that in mind as well. What type of residents are at risk for developing pressure injuries? What areas on the body do pressure injuries usually develop? And then also, um, you can name some steps to prevent development of pressure injuries. So we're going to cover all of that. So when we look at the CCAs um, and our, our personal care workers, they have a major role, really, in the prevention of pressure injuries, and that's why it was so important for us to develop this, this session, because we know that they really, in a way, have one of the most important roles in ensuring um, that our residents get good skin care, there are hands um, on the residents, there are eyes in, in examining the regis resident and looking at early detection of skin problems and looking at the prevention of those pressure injuries. We often know that the that they are the best in the best position to observe any changes, looking at daily changes and all that sort of thing. And so we know because of that, that they will benefit from having this basic knowledge about skin, about skin care, about pressure injury, and the importance of adequate nutrition and fluid intake. And we'll talk more about that. So what is the first line of defense when we talk about um, infection and, and all that sort of thing and, and how the body reacts to pressure? And we know that the skin is the body's first line of defense against microorganisms as it protects the body from all sorts of things. Um, it plays a crucial role in, in really keeping us together, for lack of a better term, but we know that, um, that the skin has, has many roles. It's able to do a lot of things and it's very adaptable as well until we push it a little bit further than it needs to be. So we also know that as we get older and as we get more disabled, um, we are more at risk of skin breakdown. We also look at the whole idea of pressure injury and how that works with the skin. And if you think about an iceberg, um, we know that 
pressure injuries start, start from the inside and work their way out. And when we talk about pressure injuries, we know that what we see at the skin surface is only the tip of the iceberg, that there is a lot going on underneath the skin and that we need to pay special attention to things like reddened areas on the skin and that sort of thing. Um, we also know that it can take up, up to, it can just take a few hours for um, pressure injuries to develop. And in some cases, we know it can be just 30 minutes with that pressure um, on an individual that can cause a pressure injury to begin to develop. And so because of that, we look at also the phases of wound healing with all the um, pressure injuries, the wounds and the ulcers that develop. And we know that there's, a, there's phases of wound heal, healing that our body goes through to, um, to heal those wounds. And so we look at the first phase of wound healing and it's called homeostasis. And we know that at this point, that's when there's an injury that has occurred to the tissue and that a clot forms. The next phase is called the inflammatory phase, and this can be anywhere from zero to eight days. And at this point, we know that the body works um, at removing debris from the wound. We talk about um, phagocytes in different parts of different components of the blood that work as little Pac-Men that kind of go around and want to um, eat anything that's foreign and, and move that away, um, away from the wound. And then we move into the proliferation phase, and that's when we see skin regrowth and the cells begin to multiply and they begin to, to repair that wound. And then we move into what's called the maturation phase, and that can be anywhere from day 21 to two years, and it really depends on how well an individual, what, what their ability is to heal. And this is when scar tissue uh, begins to develop or it has developed, and um, it's over that wound. And, and what we know for sure is that that skin that has now become scar tissue will only regain about 80% of its original strength. It's never as strong as it was when it was normal tissue. And so we always um, keep that in consideration and we work for people to understand that we need to protect that scar tissue, um, especially in the first year, um, in those first days when, when we have that maturation phase. So keeping that in mind. So just looking in summary of how a pressure injury develops, we know that um, pressure is usually from a hard surface and that can cause damage to the skin because it reduces the amount of blood that flows through the skin. So if I had you all here sitting in this room, what I would get you to do is take your thumb and your forefinger and squeeze that together really hard and squeeze that and hold that. So you can all do this where you are in the comfort of your own offices and your own homes and squeeze that. And when you pull that apart, what do you see? Well, what you see is that you see blanched skin, what we call blanched. And then very quickly, within two to three seconds, you see those capillaries refill. So if you stayed that way, maybe for the, the hour of this presentation, what you would feel after a while is you would begin to feel pain there and your body's telling you that there's something wrong. And so what's happening is that those tissues that are underneath your finger and your thumb are no longer getting the oxygen and nutrients that they need because they can't get in through the blood vessels because your blood vessels are now, are now um, collapsed. And so because of that, we know that cell death begins to happen when the skin can't get the oxygen and nutrients that it needs. And so that is really important. Something as simple as that, just to think about you know, and so if somebody is sitting in a chair or if somebody is in bed and that's going on with their tissues between um, something that is, is a hard surface and um, a bony prominence or something like that in the body, that's what begins to happen. And so if we can't relieve that pressure, things will continue to, um, to develop and then will progress to the beginning of tissue death and the development of a pressure injury. Again, it only takes, you know, sometimes we say 30 minutes, but it takes about one to two hours or less of being on that hard surface to cause that damage. So when we look at the development of a pressure injury, look at what kinds of things would um, indicate that a resident could be at risk. And so residents that can't move or they can't change their positions in a chair or wheelchair or if they're confined to bed, um, people that have had frequent or long periods where the skin is in contact with urine and stool, and we'll talk more about that um, a little bit later on and the effects of that. 
people that aren't eating or drinking enough, you know that if you become dehydrated, that your skin doesn't have the turgor that it needs to have to be resilient and to be able to rebound from having pressure applied. So think about that. Um, and any type of confusion that limits moving. So while I'm sitting in this chair and while you're sitting in your chairs, um, you may be sitting on one bum cheek. And when that starts to get numb, you're going to reposition yourself because that's not comfortable, or you're cro you've got your legs crossed and you feel that pressure on one knee and, and, and so you switch knees or maybe you just uncross your legs. So think about that, but, but think about the fact that you don't actually think about that when you do that. Um, when my body and my brain tells me that I need to reposition myself in this chair, I just do that automatically. But there's a lot of thought that goes into that um, automatically. And so people that have... Um, compromised um, perhaps brain uh, function may have problems with sending those messages to your body to tell you to move in a changed position. And those are the people that we worry about. People that also have contractures and that are in their limbs and that have, that, 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 that have a hard time um, repositioning themselves can also be at risk. We also look at people that um, can't sense pain or pressure. Obviously, um, that would put them in a compromised position. Also, people that have arms or legs that move involuntarily. And if you think about that, people that have a twitch or um, people that have um, MS or that have CP or something like that, that may cause their arms or their legs to move involuntarily. And if they're continuously rubbing against something, there's friction that's caused there. And they can develop pressure injuries as well. People that have had pressure injuries before and they're now healed, again, talking about the fact that we know that that area never heals back to 100%, they could be compromised as well. And then um, people that have become ill, um, they can be in a position as well that they're compromised. People that are obese are very thin, again, less cushioning. Um, people that are older, we know that um, we talk about that tissue paper skin in our older um, our older individuals, and we know that skin tears can be a problem, they are also at risk. And people that have disabilities, paralysis, quads, um, MS and spina bifida also, uh, because of different reasons, can be more at risk. And so when we look at what happens in relation to that, we look at things like shearing, friction, and moisture, and those can cause these pressure injuries. Um, and so we'll look at those a little bit more, but you can see um, those forces in that small diagram that's on that slide. So what is shearing? And you know, I often think about shearing sheep, and it's forces that are going in opposite directions. So if I was with you right now, I'd ask you to take your forefinger and your middle finger and just push them apart. And when you push those two fingers apart, you know, where do you feel the stress of that? And if you think about that, you push them hard enough, you can feel that stress in between in that web space in between your two figures. And if you think about that, that's where sharing stress kind of happens. And, and what you're doing is you're pushing your tissues apart. So that's just an example of what sharing stress can be. But there's various ways that we can cause sharing stress on our residents. And we look at when we're repositioning, when we're transferring them, or even leaving them in a sitting position. Um, that allows them maybe to slide down or um, to not be in a comfortable position in their bed in their chair. So that's shearing stress. Friction is also um, another force that um, can cause a lot of problems as well. And with friction, what I would get you to do is I would get you to rub your two hands together. And when you rub your two hands together, what you'll feel after a while is some heat. And if you continue to do that, your skin, because of those forces, would probably begin to develop um, calluses. If you think about wearing those beautiful shoes that you like so much that really, really look nice, but they don't fit your feet very, feet very well. And you know if you go walking for a long time, um, that after a while, uh, that friction that is on your tissues, you'll begin to develop a blister. And so that is a pressure injury that's formed from friction. So think about those things. It's um, two forces that are, that are um, equal and opposite in direction and, um, and those two surfaces that are rubbing together. And there's definitely negative consequences from that pressure. So this slide is a really good example of actually shearing and friction. And um, when you look at this picture, what do you see? 
what do you observe and what do you think would have caused um, those injuries to happen in this individual on their perineum. And so looking at that, you see various things. You see some streaking kind of friction that's happened on this individual. You also see um, a circle-shaped pressure injury as well that's dark or black. And um, so when you look at that, you know that the, probably the streaking has happened because of um, shearing and that the, the small, um, smaller area that's dark has happened because of friction and of pressure from that injury. You'll also see evidence on this slide of, um, of incontinence as well. They all contribute. We also know that um, moisture on the skin impacts a lot on, on an individual. We know that, um, you know, we, we've always been looking at briefing systems. We know that we've been encouraged to um, let people sleep through the night, that we know that the briefs are good for eight hours and maybe they can absorb the moisture, however, they're still holding it on the skin. And we do need to be checking our residents more often. So we know that the impact of moisture on the skin is, leaves that individual even five times more likely to develop pressure injuries. So moisture, looking at um, urine, we know that it keeps microorganisms on the skin. People are more susceptible to breakdown as well as fecal incontinence and to consider all of that. This is a really good slide, um, just an indication of where all the pressure points are um, and when they're found on the body. And again, I'll just remind you that we know that um, pressure injuries can begin as quickly as within 30 minutes. So when we look at early signs of pressure injury and what we look for on the skin is we look at areas that are no noticeably different than surrounding areas. And there's a whole lot of adjectives that have come to me over the years in relation to what we see when we begin to see the, the start of a pressure injury. And when we look at um, a pressure injury, one of the things we want to look at is if, if it's blanchable or non-blanchable. And so when we talk about blanchable, that's when you pulled your fingers apart and your, your thumb had actually blanched and pushed the, the, um, the blood out of those tissues. When we look at the development of a pressure injury and you put pressure on that heel, we talk about non-blanchable. And if it doesn't blanch, it means that a pressure injury is beginning to happen. Other signs to look for when we talk about pressure injuries and what our residents can be telling us is that they may complain of pain, burning, itching, and tingling in that area. Um, sometimes folks will come and tell me that when they see that reddened area that it feels spongy or it feels raised, it can also feel hard, um, all kinds of different ways. It also can feel warmer than the area surrounding it. And, um, but the most important thing about this is that you, if you do see something that you suspect could be or you've heard the resident say something or complain about something is to ensure um, that you go to your supervisor and you report that. And the other big thing is you need to document your findings. And it's really important that you document what you see, that you don't leave that till the last minute, you don't leave it till the next shift, you document what you see um, uh, that you have seen yourself. Heel pressure injuries are something that we treat just a little bit differently when we get into, and I'll be talking about the staging. But with heel pressure injuries, we know that the heel, the calcaneum of the heel is the largest bone in the foot. And we know that, that there's very little um, cushioning between the skin and that calcaneum or that heel and that bone. And we know that people will develop heel pressure injuries pretty quickly um, related to poor blood flow, when that heel is on a hard surface for any length of time. And so heel injuries are um, treated in a, in, a, in, a, in a different way sometimes than some of our other pressure injuries. The RNs and the LPNs are, are well aware of that, as well as the OT and PT. But this is when, if um, you know, we've said we've taught our CCAs to stand on their heads, to be able to look at heels. It's really, really, really important that you always examine heels every time you have an opportunity um, to look at the heels of your residents, to look for that redness, that sponginess, or that hard surface to see if anything's happening with that. So when we look at pressure injuries, we're staging them. And what we look at is um, staging, starting with stage one. And with stage one, um, the skin is not open, but it's that redness and that non-blanchable erythema that I talked about, that redness that you see that's non-blanchable. So when you press down on it, it stays red. Um, again, and it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's not open, but it's red. 
When we look at stage two pressure injury, this is what um, the RNs and the LPNs will be looking at and the OT and PT as well helping with staging. When we get into stage two, the skin is open, um, but it's still superficial. It's like that first layer of skin that's, that's no longer there. Um, the wound bed is usually pink. There's no dead tissue in that wound. Um, it also can be closed um, when we have a, a fluid-filled blister. Um, that still can be staged, considered a stage two. So if you have a blister on a heel, for example, and it's closed and you can see through it and there's fluid, it is a stage two as well. When we look at stage three pressure injuries, um, this is a deeper wound that's down to the fatty layer of the skin. The wound may also have dead tissue present, which kind of looks like, um, it can look like chicken fat or <laughs> we have lots of different adjectives to, uh, to, to describe that, but it's yellow in nature. It can be stringy. Um, it can be also gray in nature. It can also be black. And so when we look at these, you can still see the bottom of the wound, but you could have the, that there. And again, it's down um, to the fat. When we stage a pressure injury at stage four now, um, this wound is now so deep that you may see or feel bones, tendons, cartilage, or ligaments. And you can see from those two pictures that you can actually see, um, you can see the ligaments and tendons, and you can actually see the bone as well in, in this heel. Um, and again, all of these need to be reported, and of course you would have reported it before we got into this stage. There's other pressure injuries as well that we take into account and um, that we also monitor. So things that have happened from the medical device pressure injuries, we look at things that can happen, and if you look in that, at that first um, picture that we have, I'm hoping that you would probably guess that this is from a bedpan. That's uh, the buttocks that have been um, on a bedpan for too long and that have now developed a pressure injury. The problem with that now is that um, that individual probably won't be able to be toileted on a, on a bedpan now because we need to heal that up. So we need to prevent that. And one of the things you'll see a little further on is we do talk about um, not keeping a resident on a bedpan for any longer than 10 minutes, 15 at the max. Um, to make sure that we don't that they don't develop those pressure injuries, and that is really really important. The next picture there that you'll notice is caused from a catheter being underneath the resident, and um, again that's a medical device pressure injury that's developed there. We also look at deep tissue pressure injuries, and these are the pressure injuries that we see that have developed really quickly. Um, they have a deep ruber, a deep purple color. Um, they look really serious. Um, they look like they're blood filled. And with these, we know that that is just the tip of the iceberg. We know that there's a lot of tissue damage that has happened underneath, um, underneath that skill, skin. And these will develop quite quickly into something even more serious than what you see there. We also look at mucous membrane pressure injuries, things that happen from um, using um, medical devices in, in the mucous membrane, looking at oxygen, um, oxygen, uh, the nasal cannula that cause problems in the nose. Um, even on the ears sometimes, if you don't watch the, the, um, the elastic from the nasal cannulas, can also cause pressure injury on the ears, especially if a resident can't tell you that that, that is painful, so we need to, keep an eye on those kinds of things to make sure that that's not happening. And then you move into the non-stageable pressure injuries. These are the pressure injuries that have dead tissue in them and that you cannot determine what stage they are because they have that slough or that eschar in the wound um, and you can't see the base of the wound to be able to stage it. The CCIs are also, it's really important for, the, for you to understand that we do have wound dressings on our residents, that some of them can be left on for up to seven days. Your role in, in all of this is to have a good look at the dressings to see if there's drainage that's come through the dressings. If it looks like that more than half of the dressing has drainage on it, you need to report that and ensure that the RN and the LPN know that. If the dressings are rolling up, it looks, if it looks like they're leaking, that all needs to be reported so they can be changed. Um, pressure injuries on the heels may be li left open, and you'll notice that, but the big thing about the heels will be that we keep the pressure totally offloaded off those heels, um, and that, that becomes really important to you to ensure that that happens. 
So we're going to look quickly at some steps to prevent pressure injuries, and we're going to go through these nine steps individually. And so what's really important is always to eyeball our residents to examine their skin, to make sure that you're standing on your head to look at those heels, to lift the legs, to be able to have a good look at the heels, to look at all the different parts of the body to ensure um, that there is no breakdown of the skin, there's no red marks, there's no um, discomfort, the resident isn't complaining about something um, that could be an indication of something that's beginning to develop. And so if you do see something, it's really important that you document that and that you report that to your supervisor, to your RN, to the LPN. And again, all the members of the team and your management team are, um, should also be wise to um, be able to go and to report to, to those folks as well. We want, you want to ensure that you're providing good skin care. This is really important that your water be the right level, that you're using pH balanced skin cleansers and that you're moisturizing the skin with lotions and creams, um, that you're doing this at least two to three times a day. We also um, want to point out that you never massage over bony prominences, that you, skin, you cleanse the skin very gently, working in the skin folds and all that sort of thing, um, and gently pat that area dry and ensure that you're applying skin protectant barrier products to the skin to prevent it from um, urine or feces or any perspiration that the resident may have. And it's also important to avoid the use of powders and talcs. And I know in the summertime, sometimes um, you're more apt to see the use of those, but really limit those uh, because they tend to cake and cause more skin breakdown. We look at continence care and how important that is. And if we are using um, continence briefs and continence briefs and pads, make sure that they're checked every two hours um, and that they're changed when they need to be changed. We need to move away from this whole concept that they're good for eight hours. Um, we need to be repositioning our residents that can't reposition themselves, and that needs to happen a lot more often than eight hours. So it's nice that the brief system is a system that does absorb really well, um, but we need to be um, checking our, our residents and repositioning and all that sort, sort of thing at least every two hours for those that are not able to do that on their own. Um, if they are residents that can position independently, we look at every, at least every four hours and um, again looking at changing those briefs and those pads when they're soiled or when they're wet, not waiting. Never double up on um, pads for the residents. Um, if the resident voids a large amount, make sure that you're using a good absorbent product and that you have the brief um, that is the proper one to be used for that resident, that it's fitted the right way, um, and that you are using it in the way that it's intended to be used. Really stay away from soaker pads. There is plastic in the middle, and that can cause even more moisture buildup on the skin for the residents. It causes heat to be trapped. and um, we need to find other ways to ensure that we are um, absorbing um, the urine and that sort of thing. Looking at toileting routines, making sure that we have our residents um, looking at care plans and that we're doing it on a schedule as it should be done. And um, also doing an inspection of the skin every single time we toilet or we change uh, briefs for our residents. We want to manage uh, moisture associated with skin damage. Again, making sure that we're washing in the skin folds under the breast, between the abdominal folds, on the legs, on the buttocks, and between the toes. Uh, feet are really important as well um, because there's a lot of moisture that can uh, be generated there as well. Um, also look at body lotions. And when you look at body lotions and moisturizers, um, one of the things that I would encourage, encourage you is to think about things and no grease in the crease. And um, if you can kind of go by that motto, you know, no, nothing in between the toes and any area that may harbor moisture or hold in the heat. Um, again, remembering that you need to report any redness, cracks, or open areas, and you need to document your findings. And as things progress or as they get better, it's really important to document that as well. There are some moisture relieving products out there, but there's some question about using those, and you need to be very mindful of the fact that some of these things will actually um, draw moisture away from the resident, and so what becomes really important, and we'll talk about that in nutrition as well, is that we need to ensure that we're monitoring their fluid intake 
and we know what a challenge it is sometimes with our elderly population to have them drink. We also need to look at what our best practices are around sling removal. We know that sling's best practice really is that slings should be removed um, from underneath our residents for a whole lot of reasons. We know that, um, that, that if they get wrinkled, they can cause pressure areas, they can cause heat and moisture buildup with those residents. Um, wrinkles can be um, uh, an ulcer waiting to happen, and so consider all of the, these things. And we know that, again, best practice is that slings do, are removed um, for the safety of the residents. We also need to really look at the residents that we are removing slings from, and we need to ensure that we have our OT and our PT engaged in decisions around um, you know, is there an exception to that and should that sling be removed? Are there alternatives to look at to ensure that we are providing best practice to our residents in relation to slings and removal of that? We also need to consider um, when we make decisions about that, how it is for our staff as well to be removing those slings. Is it a hardship on them? Is it a hardship on our residents? And again, can't stress enough about looking at what happens when you do remove it in relation to friction and shearing. And so there are some, special, um, some specialties that our OT and PT know about. Um, one of the terms you may hear are spacer mesh. That's made of um, three different layers of mesh, and it actually helps with um, heat buildup and with removing um, and alleviating some of that heat buildup. Some of these slings can actually be left underneath our residence, but again, it really goes to um, assessing that resident to make sure that we are doing um, what we need to do for the best interest of those residents in relation to slings and, and removal of those slings. Again, looking that, at that as a team and ensuring that you're engaging OT and PT in all of those decisions. We know that our residents need a lot of support nutritionally. It's really important that they get the proper um, dental care that they that our, our oral health assessments are done yearly or more often, dependent on what the needs are of those residents. We know how often it, how, how very important it is that they get the fluids that they need and how much of a challenge it is to ensure that they do get fluids. We really need to be offering them at least every two hours um, without fail, and it needs to be part of the care that we do with our residents. We know that if they have ill-fitting dentures, if they have poor oral health, that they're going to have a harder time eating the, the, the foods that they need um, to ensure that they get the proper nutrition. And so oral health becomes really, really important in the care of preventing pressure injuries and treating them as well. Um, ensuring, again, that we also document what their food and their fluid intake is becomes really important. Um, again, looking at what we're doing in relation to oral health becomes really important. Um, and also engaging um, your dietitian in discussions about all of that, that we're working closely with them to ensure. I know that um, I'm, very, um, uh, I'm very fortunate and I share an office with our dietitian and um, through the last three and a half years, she's become uh, very proficient in understanding what happens with um, with uh, pressure injury prevention and care, and she's very engaged. Um, she is certainly one of the people that the CCAs would go to if she saw, if they saw something red and they needed um, to bring that to the attention of one of our managers. She's very engaged in what we can do in relation to um, ensuring the, the proper nutrition. We look at recreation and what recreation does around promoting activity and mobility, and we want to support all of those things and ensure that our residents get to um, any kinds of um, recreation um, endeavors that, that we have going on so that we keep their mind going as well as their body. And so that all becomes really important in keeping them moving. We want to reduce or eliminate friction and shear. We talked about that a little bit already. But um, we want to ensure when, we, when a, um, an individual is in bed that the head of the bed is not elevated any more than 30 degrees. And you can see in this diagram, it also talks about 45 and 90. And you all know that what happens when, some, when that bed is elevated more than 30 degrees is that the resident begins to move down in the bed. And then we have friction and shear going on. So we want, again, that we'll talk a little bit more of the rule of 30 degrees. 
um, again, reinforcing just the fact that our residents should not be on a bedpan or commode chair any longer than 10 minutes, 15 minutes at the max. Reduction, again, of looking at friction and shear, um, ensuring that the resident is, when sitting in a wheelchair, is sitting up at 90 degrees. Um, there's another slide that we'll look at also that will talk about the rule of 90 so that their bum is back in the chair. Um, as far as it can go, uh, their knees are bent at a 90 degrees and their feet are flat on the floor. And how important that is that we have our OT and PT um, assess those individuals so that they are fitting properly in that chair. Um, and also we can look at uh, strategies for the bed as well. So when we look at that again, that whole, this, just, this slide just reinforces that whole um, rule of 90 degrees, so the knees, the back, um, that bum is way back in the chair, it's fitting nicely, they're not sliding down in the chair. And if we begin to see that, you know, if you see somebody that is beginning to slide down, we need to ensure um, that we get help with that, that it's brought to the attention of the RN and the LPN. And if it seems to consistently be happen, we need to talk to OT and PT to ensure that they are um, fitting that chair properly to the resident, not that the resident is fit to the chair. In an ideal world, we should be repositioning our residents hourly if they're in a chair or wheelchair. Um, if the resident is able, ask them to shift their weight every 15 minutes. It might just mean that, oh, maybe you need to, you know, just lift your, lift, just um, switch your, your pressure from one bum cheek to the other. Use a language that they understand. Um, so when we look at wheelchairs, we know that the wheelchairs and the, the broda chairs as well have the ability to tilt, and we should work, use that to, um, to the resident's um, detriment as well. And so when we look at the tilt of chairs, we look at different angles for that. Again, talk to your um, OT and PT about that and look at what the abilities are of the chairs that the residents are in. They, they may tilt and you may not realize that or they're, you know, so just looking at even just a change, even 20 degrees in the, the tilt actually will, um, we, we'll see a 15% reduction in the pressure um, on those pressure areas for that resident. So again, make yourself knowledgeable about that. Look at what the chairs that the residents are in, what they're capable of doing, and, um, and, and do your best work in relation to that. And what we're looking at, when we're looking at um, how a resident is sitting in a chair and if they have a pad or a cushion, um, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but looking at, you may hear, hear that term bottoming out, and if you look at how the pelvis is made and um, those two bones that are sort of highlighted in blue, those are the ischial tuberosities, and, and when you, um, as you get older, you have less padding actually between that ischial tuberosity and the skin. And if it's sitting in a chair, it won't take much for um, that tissue to bottom out. And again, thinking back about when you held your two fingers pinched together, when that happens with the skin and those ischial tuberosities, what begins to happen is that the bones pinch off the blood flow to those soft tissues. And there's nothing um, soft under them. And so we call that bottoming out. Same, you may hear them refer to bottoming out as well, as if they have a, some kind of a cushion and that cushion is not holding them up anymore, that when they sit on that cushion, they're bottoming out, they're at the bottom of that cushion or that mattress. Again, something that needs to be reported, we need to do something about that um, to change that up. We also look at protective devices, and I'll talk a little bit more. We talked about some of these things. Um, so looking at... Um, all the pressure devices that can be used, again, making yourself aware of all of those things. So looking at pillows and heel booties that are available, again, looking at how vulnerable that heel is to any pressure injury and how important it is that um, if we suspect that that heel is not moving, that resident is not able to move and redistribute the weight and offload the pressure, pillows come in pretty handy to help with that. And what you want to do is get that heel totally off that mattress. You should be able to fit your fingers underneath that heel and the mattress. The whole thing with this is to ensure that it's um, supporting the back of the knee, but when you leave, you want to go back after five minutes just to see if the resident moved that pillow or if it got moved. It may be the resident may not be able to tell you if it's uncomfortable, and so you want to monitor that and ask them also how it feels if they're able to tell you. Um, if it's not comfortable, it's going to cause problems somewhere else. 
and the other thing is we're not going to leave it there. The other thing that we have for the heels are um, uh, sage prevalon booties as well. Um, and talk to your OT about them. We have a lot we, with the endeavors now um, that have been done with the Department of Health. We have a lot of support in getting the proper mattresses and getting the proper devices to offload. And so um, talk to your managers, talk to OT because um, those are much more readily available. And we want to prevent things from happening. We want these to be put on before we see any indication of pressure injury so that we're preventing them from happening in the first place and looking at understanding how properly, how they need to be put on properly. We also look at therapeutic cushions. This is a checklist. This, this slide is really worthy, but it, wordy, but it has a lot of really good information on it. And there is a checklist there that you can use when you look at what therapeutic cushions could be best for um, for our residents, again, it's not a CCA responsibility, but it is your responsibility to ensure that those therapeutic cushions are working the way that they're intended to work, in that they're inflated properly, um, that the patient isn't bottoming out, and all that sort of thing, making sure that the cushion is clean and dry, um, that it's not soiled, that there's nothing over it that shouldn't be there, adding more layers. So. Use this as a checklist. Um, this is something that you can always go back to and use. And again, it's, it's about a team working together, talking to the RNs and the LPNs and OT and PT to ensure that we have all those proper um, devices in place and that we're using them to their optimum and the way that they are intended to be used. We also need to really pay attention to redistributing pressure injury and, and, and that sort of thing and what we can do around positioning and repositioning our residents. There's a bunch of different aids out there to use with turning schedules. There's some facilities that have developed some wonderful turning schedules to use. When we say turning now, we're really talking about repositioning versus turning. When we, I think a lot of people, when they talk about turning, they have, you know, you're moving from side to back to side, and it's not that now. What we want to do is just make a minimal difference in how we reposition our residents a minimum of every two hours when we're looking at shifting weight. There's a whole lot of ways of being creative with that. We can use booties, we can use pillows, we can use um, wedges in various ways. Um, and I'm just going to jump ahead here. No, I'll get to that. And so being creative with how you can do that to, um, to reposition. We also look at residents that maybe we don't want to um, disturb too much at night, that they may become more rowdy or um, you know, we, we, we reposition them and they're awake the rest of the night. We want to be careful that we're, we are repositioning, but maybe just minimally, just enough to make a difference, but not by um, disturbing them too much. So think about all those things. There's all kinds of new bed surfaces out there. Again, looking at PT and OT, how they can help us with ensuring that we have those right surfaces for the right residents. We look at, there's, um, I'm sure that you have in most facilities now, uh, repositioning sheets and um, how they can be used and again working and understanding that they are designed from uh, parachute fabric that slides really well um, one across the other ensure that we are using them to their optimum and that they are being used in the best way possible to ensure uh, the best care of our residents so again lots of words on these um, slides but using them to the best of your ability and ensuring that everybody um, helps make a decision about that I mentioned about wedges. There's so many different wedges um, that can be used now. Um, again, looking at a rule of 30 with uh, positioning those wedges. Um, so looking at 30 degrees when you're altering the position of the resident, sometimes you can just pull those out a certain bit, just altering um, the position of that resident. So consider all of that, 30 degrees from supine, um, using pillows or wedges and keeping them in that position. And we have some references. And I hope we have a few minutes. Yeah, we have uh, five minutes if anybody has any questions. Um, so I'm here looking at the chat. If anyone wishes to put any questions into the chat function, again, the, the button for that is in the bottom left corner of your screen. So while we're waiting for that, just to let you know that uh, we have, again, that this, this um, PowerPoint presentation has been sent out to all the long-term care facilities actually a couple of times. 
Um, and so your uh, administrator, your director of care would be well aware of that um, if you have an educator in your facility as well. Um, when we designed this, it was designed as a self-study. It's something that you can take, maybe working on nights, and move through the, um, the slides yourself. Um, there's also a handbook that goes with it, and that's something that we also can distribute to the long-term care facilities, which just kind of touches on all the important points. Um, but it really, it will help and, and it will enhance the care that you give to your residents. We really want to look at pressure injury prevention versus, versus actually treating those pressure injuries. It's much easier um, and much more efficient if we can find ways of presenting, sorry, preventing, I'm getting all tongue tied, preventing those pressure injuries um, from developing in the first place. And again, CCAs, you really are. You're, you're it. You're the, our eyes and our hands in providing that care and ensuring that, you know, if there is something, you suspect there's something going on, you see a red spot, you see a spot that we call spongy, uh, you see something on the heel that you report that right away, and um, that we get uh, that person offloaded and we reposition them and we prevent that pressure injury from happening. I just want to, again, thank... Um, the, uh, the Nova Scotia Hospital. Oh gosh, <laughs> Nova Scotia Health Association for providing us with the opportunity to um, share all this information with you. Um, and please, uh, I encourage you to you know, spread this out to all uh, your participants in your facilities. Thank you. Uh, so no questions. Just a thank you. <laughs> that was good. We'll thank people back. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.